This podcast contains spoilers, so listen at your own risk or call back after you watch the movie. You know who you call. Leave a message. Maybe they'll call you back. Then again, maybe they won't. We're having ourselves quite a little game of bow tag here. Ring, ring, ring. Uh, I usually get this guy's answering machine. I'll call you right back. If you're there, please pick up the phone. I really want to talk to you. I check my fucking messages every day when I go home from work. My answer machine, zero. I got a blinking light. All I have to do is pick up this phone right here, inform the cinema, and your plan's kaput. No, I ain't got no phone. I had to pull, you know, because people call all the time, and uh, who needs the aggravation, right? Interruptions. Hey, man. Just after watching Alien Resurrection, just to carry that on from our Alien Tree conversation and when you were mentioning sequels and how it's okay to not do the same thing again and again and you'd rather them make a sweeping change. Well, Alien Resurrection opens up with a clone version of Ripley with an alien coming out of her stomach that they take to raise. I guess they're meant to be the military. And this moves us to maybe the first alien superhero movie. It's very hard to kind of watch this now without the X-Men movies, without the Marvel movies. And almost grown at a, which is kind of hinted at, but never fully explored a, a super-powered alien-infused splice Ripley. In a way, it's really cool. Just because I've been completely fatigued by superhero characters as of late. Just any hint of a direction going this way is a lot more boring than you would think in 2024. But maybe in 1997 when this came out, it does seem like a... A fresh idea. It's not done particularly well. But. It is something. It does give us something different. Um, it's actually written by. Joss Whedon. And. Directed by John Pierre. John Pierre. What is it? Jeanne. Would that it were. So sample. Um. Yeah, this movie is really bad in many ways. Almost every way. Save for the opening sequence when she gets brought back to life. There's a hell of a lot of overacting in this movie. Really bad. And it's almost like... It's almost like this franchise was found in the vaults of Fox. James Cameron has left. Ridley Scott has left. And a bunch of people cobbled together something to kickstart the franchise. And I do like Josh Whedon. I don't know how much final say he's had in this. There's certainly something of Whedon in this. Albeit 10 drafts removed from something that's good about Whedon. Um, Got a really cool cast of people I like. Ron Perlman is... Well, I was going to say Ron Perlman is good in this. And here's the thing. 
if you tune into the fact that this is a really dumb action movie and a really dumb monster movie. I know all the aliens are monster movies to an extent, but this is the one that really seems like a a monster movie. You know what I'm saying? It's really firmly a Frankenstein type thing. And if you accept that, accept how bad it is in places with the acting and the over the topness. For instance, there's a scene in one moment where Ron Perlman he just shoots an alien in the head and then he's <laughs> he looks up and sees a spider web, gets scared and fucking riddles the spider web and the spider with bullets. And I fucking started laughing my head off my parents started laughing and if you know what you're watching there's fun to be had here it's not a great movie not a good movie not even a decent movie really it's not a movie I'd recommend but if you do find yourself watching it there is fun here there is ridiculously over the top bad fun but Played by people who are having a good time. Ron Perlman is so easy to watch in this. He's so over the top and he's... He knows what movie he's in. And because of that, his performance is, is really enjoyable. People like Dan Hedaya, I think is his name. And Michael Wincott, who I really like. All the time when he shows up and stuff. I wouldn't say he's had a good career at all. In terms of. Like loads of roles. In fact he's probably disappeared in recent times. If if I'm honest. But it's when he shows up. I always like his voice. I always like his scowl. I always like his performances. Even the stuff like. Uh, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. He's, he's one of Sheriff of Nottingham's men. I think. That's what he is. Uh. Three Musketeers and Strange Days he shows up in as well. So he, he popped up a lot for a while in the the 90s especially. That's what I mostly associate him with. But I always like him and Brad Duroff as well. I know from Deadwood but he, he's in a lot of stuff. There's a lot of really amped up hype performances in this and we've also got the guy who he's got the guns attached to him permanently like it's really it's really camp stuff actually maybe camp stuff is the best way of of describing this and if you're okay with the campness then you're not going to have a really bad time. But if you don't go with this movie, this movie is absolutely groaning, groan-inducing. In fact, a lot of the time I was watching this, I just thought it was what the worst version of an alien movie could be. And obviously I was very critical of Alien Tree. And in a way, it's come back Alien 3, all is forgiven. Because this is just mucky. However, I still had more time, more fun of a time with this than Alien 3. Um, it's just, This is just a really stupid movie. First and foremost. <laughs> and... I don't know, man. I, the other thing I will say is the aliens themselves in this movie are fucking ridiculous. I don't know if, if whoever... Sure, it's written by Joss Whedon, but 
I don't know. I don't know the production of this. If who else got involved and what happened along the way, and especially considering Fincher's problems on on the set of Alien Three, God knows what Joss Whedon had to deal with as well, because obviously we know he can do the business if if you are a fan of him. I know a lot of people aren't. Um. But it feels like somebody watched Jurassic Park and said, you know what? It would be absolutely amazing if the aliens were like velociraptors and they were really intelligent. And in this, they're kind of going around like fucking scheming leprechauns. Even the shots of them popping up on the screen and even the use of their hands and... Just their little trickery. It's like, hoo, 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 hee, 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 look what they're doing. It, it, it's fucking weird. This decision. And at times they could have run like orcas. And they've totally changed the dynamic of. How the aliens act. And. They're not remotely. Scary. They're. This is more monster movie. I'm trying to think of examples of what I mean by that, but I I know, I kind of know, you, you'll understand what I mean. These are nothing to be scared of. These are like big, dumb bugs, almost like something like Starship Troopers. They're just big, even though they're presented as really intelligent. Just in their movement and how they're going about is just. Really not scary in this. It seems like to me that I was inspired by the Velociraptor type monsterness. Even how they use their hands and open drains. This is the first time we really get a a look at the the alien ecosystem in a in a much more. I dare say it's almost antrim. Anthropomorphic. What the fuck is that? What did I just say? What's that word? You know when they say you put human features on animals. Can't pronounce that word right now. They. It has that kind of vibe as well. And I guess. Based on the lore of Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Where it turns out that David splice them with human features I guess you can make that argument as well but that hadn't happened by the time this movie was written so you know it's almost redundant because it it isn't taught in this movie that the reason why they have human features is because they're spliced with Ripley so obviously I'm not going to call it on plot and consistency or whatever but it's more like oh these are animals that you know go around and just hang out together (laughs) even though they're very vicious they can swim around and work together and you know they're just they're just animals at the end of the day monstery animals and there is something to the fact that Ripley has a kinship with the aliens and stuff like that and she has to go to the queen and everything like that you know there is something to that never really explored her superpowers are never really explored but I'm kind of thankful for that Um, and nowhere more strongly is this showing its monster movie nucleus than the fact that now the aliens can be born by natural birth and when this new alien comes ho 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 this new alien is even more deadly than all the other aliens and 
It just fucking looks ridiculous. It looks like a, a piece of fucking shit. And it's got these kind of human features and human eyes. And it's like, mommy! That makes this cute sound. <laughs> it's just so bad. Uh, and it almost... I was expecting it to go, mommy! To Ripley. And you know, Joss Whedon does get this stuff right in a lot of episodes of Buffy and... Maybe he wasn't as good as a writer at this point. Maybe he didn't get to do his vision, but it just doesn't work. And we own a we own a writer who's pretty bad in this as well, isn't she? Turned out to be a droid. <laughs> and that final sequence where she gets uh, the the new alien that's with the stupid nose thing and it seems to skull and it's like a weird deformed marshmallow it sucked out that little bit in the like we've we've had the alien get sucked out in a few of these movies now but never through this tiny hole as it absolutely sucks out his blood bits by bits just before it gets back to earth which would have destroyed the earth you have to laugh like it just have to laugh at that scene. It's just fucking ridiculous. So ridiculous. So many things in this movie are absolutely ridiculous. And it was the time in the 90s where we had the the over earnestness and over the top of how fucking serious this is, man, how fucking crazy this is. <laughs> But just watch something like that now. It's just like a comedy. But. Kind of had fun as well. It's a bad movie. To be clear. But. I had fun with it. Anthropomorphic. That's the fucking word. Oh yeah. Another scene that was quite cool as well was when Ripley sees all the other failed clones of herself that was pretty fucked up and obviously we get one of the clones is still alive and does that classic line of he and like me obviously that made it funny because that's the line that every fucked up creature said but before that moment um, it was a pretty gripping scene and Ron Perlman has that excellent line afterwards when he says fucking waste of ammo <laughs> which I was thinking as well Ron Perlman is great in this and uh, yeah she just flamed towards all the clones and stuff moments like that stand out and it, that's classic Joss Whedon as well. Oh yeah. And one other thing I will say. In conclusion about all this. I do appreciate Sigourney Weaver quite a lot. As an actress. After all these movies specifically. She. We do get the full range of different versions of Ripley. And she's she's very different in it. Even in the first one where she's meek to begin with. In the second one she's meek and gets quite capable. And her fright, fight or flight turns to fight. And in the third one we get a, a more tough masculine Ripley. And in Resurrection we get a completely... A little bit fucked up, a little bit creepy, a little bit sinister, a little bit overwhelmed with her power, Ripley. And Sigourney Weaver does a brilliant job of of all those Ripleys. Hey, man. Uh, you sent those voice notes, like, two weeks ago. And I just haven't had the chance to watch the movie sit until now, so... I'm going to offer my thoughts, but I'm not sure how good your memory is going to be on some of the fighter boys 
In fact, I'm not sure how good my memory is going to be on some of the finer points of this movie because I watched it across two nights. First night I was exhausted, thought I could probably get through the whole movie. Ultimately, started falling asleep, just rewinding, rewinding, and falling asleep again. And I was like, okay, I'll watch the, the rest the next day. And then the next day I did watch the, the final 40 minutes or so, but it was like sort of standing up, holding a baby. And yeah, it's all a bit disjointed for me. But I've listened to your voice notes now, I've taken some notes in them. So I'm kind of, um, should be able to kind of piece together something. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, we, we had this conversation about Alien 3 that was sort of somewhat informed by the fact that you were seeing it um, in the midst of a big Alien franchise rewatch, which I suppose has given you... All, like, you, 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 you automatically are inclined to, to compare them to one another, thinking that it's impossible not to. Whereas I was watching Alien 3 just as a standalone movie, as a sci-fi monster movie, horror, action, whatever, you know, but just basically as a singular thing. And I think that the Alien movies, to their credit, do kind of work like that um, until you get to Prometheus and Covenant and there's, it's a bit more of a lore-driven thing, but up until that point, it's kind of like humans in a location, monsters on the loose, go. That's what you get over time and time again. And certainly they differ in quality, but I think um, it's interesting for me now, sort of coming to them, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, just as sort of standalone movies. Of course, watching this one, I did have the context of... Alien 3, and I had our conversation, which touched on Alien and Aliens, which of course I've seen many times. So, I probably had the franchise a bit more top of mind going into this, but at the same time, I can't remember a lot of what happens in those movies. So, I was really just watching this as a film on its own. Uh, it's a film I've seen once before. I, I would guess I probably saw it in about 98. I think it came out in 97, so probably shortly after it was released on video would be when I saw it. In fact, I can't say for sure, but I've got a suspicion this might have been my introduction to the franchise. Um, of course, Alien and Aliens were released sort of before my time. I'm not sure if I was alive when Aliens was released, but certainly would have been too young. Would have been, you know, one or something. So, Alien 3, I think, I do remember watching it as a teenager or as a child or something, somewhere along the way I watched it, but it wasn't really like um, something I have vivid memories of. And then Alien and Aliens, I actually don't know when I first got them. I can't remember, like, my introduction to those movies, but I vividly remember Alien Resurrection. I remember the night that we watched it and it was like a movie night getting a bunch of videos and all that and of course you know a, a, when when would that have been I mean, that would have been almost 30 years ago 25 years ago so my memory isn't particularly sharp i mean i can just end the sentence there but my memory for this movie isn't particularly sharp but at the same time, re-watching it now, it's amazing how much you remember. You know, like right from the beginning, the, like the the uh, the knife dropping into the French guy's leg and certain lines of dialogue and yeah, just the, the there's a lot in this film that I immediately remember. And I think it's because the things that would have stood out to me as a child. Um, it's certain lines of dialogue where like I would have I can just picture myself at that age being like oh that's cool or oh that was you know that was intense or whatever um but beyond that there's a sort of um there's a general tone to the movie that I never would have um never would have been able to like articulate 
back then, uh, I probably wouldn't have even been particularly conscious of that tone in contrast to other movies. But when I see the sort of first half of the film now, I immediately remember experiencing that tone and that pacing, this kind of like somewhat boring and serious and dark and kind of depressing and joyless um, first half of the film where all of the Joss Whedon jokes that are sort of, sort of there to cut through that tension and lively it up a bit are very cynical and dark and it just creates this whole um, downery vibe when compared to let's say Men in Black or whatever like blockbusters were out at the time that I might have been watching. Now, you have, your your voice is very interesting because it, I think that you feel like you're mounting a defense for this film by saying, look, it's trash, but like I had fun with it. It's, it's, it's you know, it's got a lot of fun things. Like it, it, it sounds to me like you're, you think that you're a champion of a bad movie. Ironically, we're going to disagree like quite heavily on this film because I think it's not a bad film. I think it's a good film. Um, and I think the funny thing is that our um, opinions, our respective opinions on the franchise at large are very diverse. Like you, now granted this only emerged on rewatch, but you had fun with Covenant. Um, I know you said that it's a piece of shit, but you had fun with it second time round because you were just sort of like, look, I can enjoy all of the ridiculous stuff because I'm not expecting anything out of this movie. Now, I might have that experience with Covenant if I rewatched it. I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I've only watched Covenant once and I think it's up there with the worst films I've ever seen, like the worst slogs I've ever had through a movie. So if there's a turnaround in Covenant for me personally into um, like just having any kind of fun, then that would be a real turn up for the books. Um, Alien 3, I think, has a lot to offer. Um, I think the world, the characters, the acting, I think the major thing that it gets wrong is the aliens. Um, but, you know, you thought it was unbearably bad. Again, it's, I'm not thinking. I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, but I think I'm much more middle middling on on Alien Three, and you're very negative. Um, Alien, I suspect we agree on. Um, Aliens, I know that you're. I mean, we probably both think it's a masterpiece, but your frustration with Newt is more extreme than me. Um, so it's just interesting that I think there's a kind of like this canonical opinion that is shared across film fandom and alien fandom on like how you'd rank the movies and stuff and I think in our conversations there's been just a lot of mild disagreement now back to this film um I think the first half of it now I'll, I'll caveat by saying I watched it across two nights I was very tired the first night um I'm incredibly stretched and tired at the moment. My daughter's just waking up every night and I'm having to like spend hours every night comforting her and stuff like that. So it's, uh, yeah, there, th this is not going to be the most clear eyed, um, interpretation of the films, but I, w I will say that the first half of the movie, as I said, is a bit dull and lifeless. Um, and I was sort of ready to dismiss it as like, Okay, I can see some of the things you're going for here, like the things that you highlighted, where you got like, these are great actors. Are they great characters? No. But they are, there's numerous people in this film that I love seeing pop up. Um, it's good ideas. It's Joss Whedon, who's like one of the best writers of all time, I would say. Um, certainly one of the best kind of like pop entertainment writers of all time. I imagine this film came out around the same time as Buffy. Uh, Buffy premiered obviously a very different tone it's going for and I think if you look at like uh, Firefly and Serenity you can see him 
doing a, a story about like a ragtag crew of space pirates or whatever, but much more within his tone that he's comfortable in. So I think that uh, there's a mishmash there between writer and subject, or writer and pro IP. However, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of good ideas here, um, and, and come the sort of halfway point, I was sort of ready to dismiss it. Um, I was like, you know, I like the ideas. I liked pretty much all of the ideas, but I've seen a lot of this done better in other Alien movies, and there isn't really any particular reason to to watch this one because it's just kind of like everything, every compliment you can pay it, you, you just go, yeah, but just watch the better version of that in some other, in one of the first two movies. Second half of this movie, I think, is pretty damn good. Like, again, there's one interpretation is just comparing it to Alien and Aliens, and then it's just like, well, basically every movie sucks then. But as a standalone action sci-fi horror monster movie, I think the second half of this film, particularly the third act, is kind of as good as it gets for these sort of like um, movies that come out every six months or something, like things like Life and stuff like that. Is it, as, is it as good as it gets when we bring into the conversation, you know, some of the best films of all time? No. Is is it? Can it touch the hem of the garment of aliens? No. But um, really, really, really strong, I think, uh, in terms of both ideas and execution and action and stuff in the second half. Um, so, yeah, that I'll, I'll state all that now, and then I'll kind of, like dig into that a bit more as I go through the notes that I took on your um, on your voice notes there. So uh, you mentioned that it's kind of like an alien superhero movie and uh, that we're now like things like her catching the basketball and stuff like we've seen that a thousand times in Spider-Man and the like now so we're just like maybe a little bit more uh, it, it's, it doesn't do as much for us as it might. Um, Perhaps I didn't think of it as a superhero movie because I just don't think of her as a hero as heroic at, at all because she's so nihilistic and clearly doesn't care about um, anything. She's more just like a, she reminds me of, let's say, something like species, like these these things where one of the main characters is an alien or a robot or a clone or something and they're just sort of like new to the world and um they're they're almost just more like curious about what's what's out there but they don't have any particular mission now i think that is part of why this film struggles in the first half is it it takes a long time before we have anything worth investing in like we, it takes a long time before there's any characters that we give a shit about their mission or their survival or anything like that. Um, it's at the beginning of the film, you haven't got people to relate to and you haven't got a threat and you haven't got um, a goal that, that that's worthy of investment or is even clear. So it's, it's a bit rudderless for a while. But on a, on a character level, we sort of separate that and we forget about like some of the problems it caused and we just go as you said Ripley has evolved over the over the course of the franchise and take looking at this new interpretation of her I think it's brilliant I mean I think I love that we are four films deep into a franchise we get the same actress back the iconic actress who's um synonymous with the franchise even though we killed her off in the last one and obviously they made the Joss Whedon joke about that I was like yeah I get that a lot um but how do we get her back? Well, we get her back in a way that is legitimately interesting. She's now not human. Um, it's not like they go, oh, we, we there was some of her DNA left over, so we were able to clone her. And now she's just exactly the same character as before, where it's like just a, a stupid retcon that, that means that her death meant nothing. No, this is like they ride out 
what kind of a beast she is for literally the entire film um in so many different ways like the, the, even right down to the final death scene of what is essentially like her child being sucked through the thing and how emotional it is for like it's it's brilliant i think uh scorny plays it really well um i agree that she's a good actress i think that this is probably one of the most challenging iterations of Ripley that she's had to do because although she's she's really good in all of them what she has to do in the first film is more like a scream queen type thing I, I, I'm not in any way um, discrediting that because uh, we've certainly seen thousands of actresses fail to make that interesting or pull it off but I, I think that she's navigating much more untrodden terrain here uh, so yeah this kind of as you put it superhero or however you want to put it iteration of Ripley I think is like really interesting well acted a great addition to the movie great to be getting new stuff for films deep into this franchise um yeah uh, I mean I'm just putting my notes here <laughs> that you you said the movie is really bad like I think I've covered like, I just I don't feel that way about it at all I think uh I I'm glad that I gave it a chance in isolation away from um, Alien and Aliens. And I've actually, like, as much as I think you've probably done the more rich, rewarding thing of, like, watching all the Alien films, I really liked doing this, like, what's, what's the best chance I can possibly give these massive, big, iconic movies from our childhood, Alien 3, Aliens, you know, like, we might not have we might have liked them we might hate them but these were big tentpole releases well watching them separate from the original i think it's rare that people do that for good reason you kind of want to watch the best stuff you're going to watch all of the terminator movies you want to, you don't want to be just watching the bad ones but if you do for some reason watch just terminator 3 onwards at least you're you're giving those films probably the best shot. I mean, I say that out loud now, and then I realise how lore-driven the Terminator movies are, and I think it's the, the Alien movies are helped by the fact that at least Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection are just straightforward monster movies without much lore. Like, they're set hundreds of years apart. The characters in them, other than Ripley, don't really have any context of what happened in the other movies, so it's... Uh, Maybe it's a franchise that's uniquely suited, or not uniquely, because I think you could do this with like Death Wish and like a lot of these films where they're just kind of like rehashing. But um, yeah, anyway, I, I had a ball with that. I love uh, Amelie, which bizarrely is the film that Jean-Pierre Jeunet made directly after this. If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, although I think it might have been a few years because maybe he was a bit battle scarred from this. I also really like A Very Long Engagement, which is the film he made after Amory. And then I think maybe it was Mick Max? I'm not sure. I feel like there was like a big gap. Um, his other, his films after A Very Long Engagement, which are lower budget and, and like less looking for an international audience or any kind of like mainstream claim are less interesting to me. And then I think the film that got him Alien 3 was city of lost children which i actually forget if i've seen her and i don't know i've started it but i've got a feeling i might have ended up not watching it or something and i believe that was ron perlman kind of explains the link there's the french guy and this is also in all of his movies but i have a lot of respect for him as director and i think if you look at amelie you can see how how incredible he can be as a director even if it's it was a fleeting moment, like what he brings as a director to the table, technically, and all the storytelling within Amelie is like incredible. So this, this film is in capable hands, but obviously just like Alien 3, it doesn't really matter how good of a director you get in the hot seat. If the movie is ultimately directed by the studio, then it's kind of irrelevant. Um, we get little bits of camera work in this that are 
that feel Jean-Pierre Genet, but they almost work against the film because they're just too idiosyncratic for what this film is, whereas this film is more of a kind of late 90s, you know, generic blockbuster. And I think all of the good stuff comes from the script, really, uh, the ideas that it has. Now, he's, he does a, a capable job, but um, not he, he, this isn't a movie where you watch it and you go, I want to see what else this director has done. Um, another name I noticed in the credits, along with J- Joss Whedon, which was a surprise, actually, was Pitoff. And I was like, Pitoff? That guy, that's a director, right? Looked it up, Pitoff. He must be in my head because he directed Halle Berry's Catwoman movie. Um which I've never seen, and I, I don't think I've ever seen a Pitoff directed film. So it's kind of surprising that he's, that I actually have such a memory of his name, but I think it's because for starters, you always remember these directors who are just named one word, like Tarzem, who directed The Fall. Um, secondly, Catwoman was a very notorious box office bomb and critical failure, so I think that would have for the wrong reasons, got his name sort of floating out and about a bit more. Um, and yeah, he, 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 uh, comes from a background of various other roles within filmmaking, but in this, he's a a visual effects guy and the visual effects in this film are really, really good. I think, um, I was highly surprised to see how little CGI is in the film. I don't know if that's because it was cheaper to do it for real or or what i really don't know what the the kind of decision making behind that was but it's almost all practical aliens in this film um now there's some scenes like when the alien is carrying ripley along where it's such a tight shot because obviously they can't go any wider without either switching to cgi or making a way bigger fake alien and it, it, you see, you get the kind of limitation there, but for a lot of the shots in this movie and a lot of like the, the aliens that they build, I think they look fantastic. Like, I think they really look good. This film does a lot of good stuff with the aliens. Now I'll dig in a little bit into your comments about, um, you felt it was laughable at times. Um, I would say alien, and this is about the, least controversial statement you could ever make about any film but i'd say alien by ridley scott does great with work with the alien famously uh, doesn't doesn't show it much and you know it kind of does it, it's almost like it set the rules along with jaws maybe of how to do a monster movie and then aliens again does incredible work with the aliens the uh the the queen for example, um, wait, hang on a second. I'm just going to end this voice note because I've just got to quickly text my wife just to say I'm going to be a little bit late home um, and then I'll, I'll jump back on talking about aliens. Yeah, okay, so aliens, um, I think that the, I, again, this is going back quite a while. I haven't seen aliens for a while, so your memory would be fresher. But for me, the fact, A, it's in the title, it's multiple aliens, is genius. It's like, one of the simplest ideas that's a brilliant idea I've ever seen in, in cinema. We're like, how do we make a sequel to Alien? Well, maybe the alien is, is in a hospital now. Maybe the alien is here. It's like, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. what about if we put an S on the end of that word? There we go. That's your movie. Incredible. And then the fact that it has the, the queen up its sleeve is amazing. Alien 3, as we discussed at length, somehow manages to not get the aliens right and doesn't do anything good with the aliens and when we were talking about it we um we discussed how the fact that it moves like a, an animal like it like a little dog um and po- presents basically no threat whatsoever and, and is essentially missing from the movie in any kind of meaningful way maybe and this could be a, a bit generous in our interpretation but maybe that's because it, it comes from an animal we haven't seen an alien that's been birthed from an animal rather than a human and that's um whether that's kind of clutching at straws or that was 100 percent the intention of the filmmakers 
it's it's still interesting when discussing this kind of ongoing evolution and reinterpretation of the aliens in this film we get a lot more done with the aliens because of this mad scientist splicing movie that it is where we get and you could you could debate whether all of the aliens in this movie or just some of the aliens in this movie are um have human genetics in i will put aside the the uh the the stuff that happens in alien covenant because you just reminded me of that now um, and obviously that wasn't part of the decision making on this movie unless that stuff is in some sort of alien novel or something i don't know but we'll just assume that what we see in alien covenant was not part of this film in that regard i think introducing the concept of human alien splicing is incredible i think that that yields so much good stuff in this movie um and i think like just as an idea it's incredible forget about it in the movie as an idea it's incredible it's execution in the movie i personally enjoyed i think i got a lot out of it i'm not going to say this is you know one of the great movies or anything like that but i got a lot out of that um and when we see the aliens strategizing and talking and planning and tricking and all that kind of stuff it i i think it's reasonable to to think about either the fact that they're um partially human dna which they might be they might not be i'm not sure really um but also they're being taught right they're, they're we see brad Dourif um doing his thing with the like red button and everything which is a mad scientist movie and also beyond any of that i don't think we've seen stuff in alien or aliens or alien 3 for that matter that like hard and fast negates the idea that they could have um some sort of like strategy and like working together and stuff like that i mean pretty much all predatory animals have that so why wouldn't the aliens have that so it's, it's not like we see them like playing poker or something um but yeah uh that worked for me um i think you mentioned like james cameron's left ridley scott has left I think this film like is such a refreshing look at like how good the franchise could be if Ridley gets his hands off it and obviously he's not present in Alien 3 which is uh an okay movie in my books um certainly wasn't involved in Alien vs Predator and I didn't like that when I saw it and I've never seen Requiem so that's the one alien movie that I haven't ever seen but then when he gets back in I I really enjoyed prometheus but it's not an alien movie um it's just a really scott sci-fi movie that's decent and then when he goes full bore back into the alien franchise with covenant i think that is a terrible movie and i haven't seen romulus yet you have and this is this we might now enter a, a weird form of this uh conversation where I'm responding to voice notes you sent two weeks ago when you hadn't seen Romulus. Now you're, you've seen Romulus, you can barely remember Resurrection, and you've got a whole other movie in your head. <laughs> so I appreciate that you might not be able to respond to all of this as, as clearly as you would otherwise. But my understanding of Romulus is it's produced by Ridley Scott. Um, and I, I, at this point, until Ridley dies, I don't think that we'll see alien stuff that doesn't have some degree of oversight and control might be a light touch but it's definitely it's, it's a ridley scott property now rather than a 21st uh, 20th century fox property there's a new tv show coming out by the guy made fargo which intrigues me um but i don't think the ideas and, and script and stuff are getting zero eyeballing from uh ridley but this one is just like a bunch of creators uh, Joss Whedon's the only credited writer, but I'm sure there were other people involved. Um, and Jean-Pierre Genet, and just like, just make a movie, just make it, make a, make a fun, well, not fun, <laughs> but make a an action monster sci-fi movie. And that's refreshing to see something with as little baggage, because it's got plenty of its own baggage that it brings to the table itself. So to to not be beholden to some sort of expanded universe type thing is a uh, 
refreshing. Um, and some of the, some of the stuff that you thought was, um, laughable, like Perlman shooting the spider to me, that's very much strikes a similar tone to the Bill Paxton character in aliens. I, I think like these kind of, um, meatheads pop up throughout the franchise. And I think everyone we get in this movie is as good of a character, but in a much worse movie than the characters that we get in the first two movies. Um, James Cameron is able to do wonders with flimsy characters. We've seen this in Titanic. We've seen this across his entire filmography. Ridley Scott, like what he does with these kind of archetypes and these kind of blue collar workers, combining that with a horror movie, a certain monster movie was so novel and is still like brilliant. But I think the characters in this are fine. And I think he, you know, Perlman shooting the spider after he's been, he's in a, he's a really tense, such a life and death situation, shooting, killing, but it's like, then he gets scared by a, a spider and he shoots it. We've seen Perlman, what a complete idiot he is and what a like just violent, aggressive type he is. I, 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 to me, that is not, um, uh, that, that type of thing doesn't take away from the film to me. It, it's it's like it's that's what we're here for. If we if we, we're not getting that, then the whole problem and character might as well not be in the movie because that's just like that's the type of thing that you get with these these uh these complete archetypes um, and the the posse that they put together, both the the pirates, but then everyone across the movie is brilliant. Um, almost every single role in this film is fil filled by someone who I really like, as you said. Um, I, I love that about blockbuster ensemble movies that the budget allows an interesting director to just go anyone, any cool character actor that I want, I get because we've got, we can just, you know, pay them more than they're used to getting. Um, I think Winona Ryder, I really like as an actress and I've really liked a lot of stuff about her, but I think she is kind of the weak link here. Um, in that her character and her, um, I don't know, her, her performance, everything, it's just not really, it, it's not interesting or entertaining like everyone else in the movie is. And I just don't get the robot thing within this franchise. Like I know one of the most iconic characters is a robot. Well, now two of the most iconic characters because Fassbender is a robot too. Um, I can't really remember how Lance Henriksen plays uh, Bishop, is it? Fassbender, I remember a bit better, but I feel like Winona is the most human. Like, her performance in the first half of this movie is completely undetectable as a robot. And that just raises more questions than I think this film has the space to answer, or this franchise, really. Uh, unless we get like a Ridley Scott directed movie about the creation of the synthetics, which, you know, I can totally imagine happening, but I don't understand the motivation between it's behind having robot characters that are in no way robot. Like they, if they made her a hacker so that she can g get into the mainframe and, um, divert the ship or whatever, then that would works so much better with this character than the idea that she's a robot but in no way is she robotic and if you're going okay well ai robots all that it's gotten to the point where like they're just completely undetectable physically undetectable socially undetectable all that kind of stuff that's you almost like you could say that's somewhat interesting but you kind of just killed robots as an entertaining thing on screen look at something like ex machina Alicia Vikander, that's entertaining, right? Because she's doing a performance that's different to just like a random person in a movie. And once you take away any amount of difference whatsoever, then um, I don't know. I just don't get it. Uh, so that was that was a bit of a weakling. But I also really like her as an actress. So I kind of I didn't think that she that the character was good in this. But like 
it's just another person to go, oh, they've been in the Indian franchise, cool. Um, the mad scientist stuff I love, I think uh, probably my favorite human character across the franchise is, is it, I forget the name of the, um, actor, is it Michael Reiser? Probably getting that name wrong, but it's the guy in Aliens who's like the, the corporate, um, the guy who's like there specifically as the attache for the Wayland Corporation or whatever. And he eventually, it's eventually revealed that he's like kind of the, almost the true baddie of the film. Like the aliens themselves are like just a force of nature. They're almost like, it's almost like a disaster movie. Whereas he is the actual baddie. And time and time again, we go back to this idea of human baddies. Certainly the humans that show up at the end of Alien 3 are the true baddies of that film. And in this film, the head scientist, because you're expecting maybe to be Dan Hedaya or something, but it's the head scientist who is the real baddie of this film. And he is forgetting about the acting and all that, but just like as a, as a character, he's a brilliant baddie. I love that there's a mad scientist. I mean, there's numerous mad scientists in this movie and, and Brad Dourif would sit as a mad scientist in the lab and then also as a almost like religious level mad scientist in the, the cocoon area is brilliant but this this um baddie that we get like he's deliciously evil and i really like that and i just love all the like this kind of like god complex playing with fire creating something that will be our own destruction um consequences be damned he couldn't care less that we're gonna take this thing back to earth and end civilization and um and then just the kind of marveling at your creation even when it's terrifying that that's all really good mad scientist stuff to put in this movie and works really well in my opinion um i think one of the biggest disagreements between us is like the <laughs> the alien hybrid thing that is half human and half alien um and i just think that that is amazing like that is one of the best things across the entire alien franchise for me you found it laughable i thought it looked absolutely horrific i thought the monster design on it was like it was the only thing since hr geiger first designed the xenomorph in the first alien movie it's the only thing i think that's is amazing i forget are the face huggers in the first movie because they're obviously amazing but i don't i i, I think the, the the queen is is amazing forget forget her. queen is amazing and that's an, that's an introduction into the franchise at a later point but the queen is still is basically like a bigger version of the the alien the, the classic alien to bring in a whole new monster, a whole new concept, and it look this good and look this disgusting and look this scary and tragic and fucked up and and threatening, and the fact that as soon as it comes out, it then kills the queen like that is just so badass, man. They they got the effects like it's one of the most ambitious visual effects I've ever seen to make something like that and and have it look. I mean, clearly to you, it looks laughable, but the 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 the, uh, the chance of it looking laughable is so high that the fact that they really smashed it, in my opinion. Um, but I say this as someone who watches a lot of like cheap horror movies, and I've just seen my fair share of really ambitious monsters that that look like a complete joke. This looks just so good, and it is so scary. Like it's just. It, it, the visuals are there the 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 eye sunken eye sockets the the sad face the just fucked up human and like to even just task a monster maker with making something that's halfway between a human and a xenomorph and for them to get this far with something that looks this good is highly highly surprising to me um so yeah i was all in but then but then the as a character, it's to have something that's so tragic and terrifying and and singular in its uh, 
in its ambitions and, and its behavior and then have it uh, not be the main, like not be in every scene of the movie, just like pop up late in the day at the end of the movie as a little Easter egg or whatever, you know, a little kind of surprise, kind of like the queen in Aliens. That is amazing. Like that's, yeah, I think that alone for me makes this essential viewing. Um, so yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that we disagree with on, uh, I think that's like five star brilliant monster. Um, the other visual effects and kind of like grotesque imagery are also incredible. Like Ripley is sort of sinking into that undulating mass of tentacles and machinery and just the kind of it, it, it's as H.R. Geiger as it gets is it Geiger or Giger I'm not actually sure how to pronounce his name but that um that shot and that kind of concept is peak alien franchise like peak what makes this a visually strong franchise um and all of the like uh the water and saliva and whatever that the liquid that drips off the aliens across the whole thing is brilliant if there's a shot of an alien inside i think it's leland orser's body and then that bursts through his chest through the through the face of the mad scientist like it's just it's so full of incredible stuff the second half of this movie and it kind of kicks off with the underwater chase scene which is uh, i can't remember if the underwater chasing or the the clone all the clones and vats, which I did remember from growing up uh, when I first saw it. I can't remember which one comes first, but like around that point, it, it kicks off the good stuff. And you know, the kill me scene is brilliant. The All of the different things, which kind of like reveals why she's got an eight on her arm in a way. Um, basically, Stranger Things <laughs> rip that off. Like it's exactly the same uh, idea. But yeah, then the underwater chasing is really, really good. Um, it's the one thing in this movie that is like often talked about as being really good and maybe it's because of that it's a bit overhyped and it's also like the most cgi alien that we get i think they do a good job considering the era but uh yeah it's it's got good things and bad things about it but it's but it's good it's a very good sequence and i think from there on out it's just like non-stop good stuff uh, and jam-packed full of good stuff from there um and yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. Like to, to sum it up, like it, I think whenever we disagree about a movie, and there's been certainly many movies that we disagree about, what actually happens is that we don't feel polar opposites about it. You think it's pretty bad, but like it's entertaining. I think it's you know, got loads and loads of problems, but ultimately it's got so much good stuff in the second half that, that I like it and I say it's a good movie that I recommend. But because we you know, are kind of responding to what the other one says, it kind of ends up feeling like one of us thinks it's terrible, one of us thinks it's a masterpiece. Um, so, and, and I don't know what uh, thoughts you'll be able to offer now, ha it having been a while since you've seen it, but without, any gi without giving any spoilers for Romulus, um, because I haven't seen that yet. It'd be interesting to hear now, a couple of weeks in, another movie at least. I mean, I'm not sure what if, if this was... Was this the last one you watched before Romulus? Or did was, is there something else I'm missing that you would have seen after Resurrection and before Romulus? But with, with where you're at now, and the dust has settled, and you're probably further away from the likes of Aliens and Alien, um, has your opinion changed at all? Um, and... Would you recommend Alien Resurrection? Right. Yeah. Two weeks later. Do you know what this message is like? It's going to be like... You know when someone's doing a voiceover of... A post-apocalyptic movie. And trying to remember the, what civilization was beforehand. Where you're kind of... We are kind of saying, well, I remember. All I remember is now. 
I don't remember before. And that's kind of how I feel about Alien Resurrection. In terms of having a complete handle on what the fuck I'm talking about. Now, it is true that when we disagree on aspects of a movie that <laughs> it does sound like this guy is really championing this movie and this guy is really shitting on this movie so it is also good that you keep on clarifying that among ourselves because it does keep it grounded <laughs> It's some kind of reality where it's not like a presumed innocent trial where we're just lawyers on a, a stand trying to give trying to give our own passionate defense of the points we agree with and disagree with. So yeah, that's important. So at this point, I can only remember a feeling and my feelings of it rather than my in-depth analytical eye that would have been the first voice note. Now, it is a absolute crying shame that we can't add Alien Romulus to this whole conversation because it's not only is it really relevant to Alien Resurrection, it's really relevant to the whole franchise. And there's a whole debate about that that we've had prior to me seeing Alien Romulus and certainly prior to you seeing it as well, which you still haven't, that just ties into all these conversations really well and really interestingly actually but I will put aside any alien Romulus talk because I come into a blind I'd rather you go into a blind as well and not know anything so I'm gonna park that there so a few things I agree with you that the Ideas in Alien Resurrection are really good. And I feel if they were done better, I would be championing the whole movie. If, I don't know, he probably wouldn't do this now. He'd probably make a mess of it nowadays. But if Christopher Nolan was directing... Uh, an alien resurrection. Actually, no. Do you know what? This feels like if Guillermo del Toro directed <laughs> Alien Resurrection. If he got his hands on these ideas and these material. I mean, we kind of had it a little bit with The Shape of Water. <laughs> but if he got his hands on these ideas, I think they could be really interesting and really worthwhile. So I, I do agree. The fact that uh, movie number four we get a brand new Ripley that's completely different that doesn't shit on what happened in Alien Tree that doesn't shit on the character and that takes the character in a completely new way and reboots the character but not in a cheap way aka the Alien, sorry, the Marvel multiverse where they're like, hey, yeah, that doesn't matter because we still got the actor around. And even if they start off different, it will remind you of the person that you lost in every way. This reminds us. This doesn't remind us, should I say, of Ripley in the slightest, really, like in terms of her characterization in any of the other movies. Um. So, yeah, that's really good. Another thing that I forgot to mention that I remembered one really horrific scene in Alien Resurrection is that the way that they're importing the people in cryo and putting the the embryos 
into them, that's really good. So I agree that there's so many good ideas in this movie. But ideas don't mean much to me if the if the execution isn't very good and obviously we've had that conversation in a way, but just to apply to a few of your things, you mentioned the the Ron Perlman character and shooting a spider and the character would do that. Okay, well the only thing do you know what it's like? It's like if you've got two defenders in a football <laughs> in a football game, one of them has an abundance of talent and the other person, if used right, you can cover up the cracks and everything that's wrong with that other center defender. Well, a good script and a good director is like the first central defender and then the archetype is like the limited central defender that if he isn't working alongside the world-class amazing defender to run the show, you will just see nothing but the limitations of the second defender. <laughs> For an analogy, if you don't understand football, well, I mean, I know you do, but that's probably pretty esoteric if you don't understand football but yeah so things like the Ron Perlman's character and you compared him to um, what's his name Bill Paxton yeah they're kind of the same but a second aliens the second aliens covers over any of that and uses it in a good way, utilizes Paxton, makes him make sense, makes him just fucking brilliant character. And of course, Paxton's had limits of like, game over, man, game over. And then when we get the crazy bullet scene of that character, he has been building towards that the whole movie. James Cameron puts that archetype in an arc in itself that really makes it make sense. Not on the is really executed with sense in fucking Alien Resurrection. So, Ron Perlman shoots a load of bullets at a spider web. And then, five minutes before that, he's cracking a line about, oh, why is she wasting bullets? It must be a woman thing. And it's just, you can't, you can't, you just, it doesn't work in that way because it's not used properly and then the alien coming out of the cryogenic people why do they have to be awake for that there's just for every good idea there's, there's just the the heavy hand of someone who doesn't quite have a handle on this material and yeah i agree that the aliens being clever and for all intents and purposes this is the first time that they've been spliced is a good idea my problem isn't that the aliens are intelligent. My problem is we get stupid shots of the aliens' hands pulling down fucking drains and popping up to the corner of a frame before disappearing in the frame in in a way that's almost like a, the Phantom of the Opera at times. And... So all these good ideas are executed really bad. I think the directing is really bad in this movie. And so, well, let's just not let's not use the word bad. My problem, my main problem with this, and again, you, you said that I'm mounting a defense. Well, it's kind of two things at once because I had a good time with this movie. I was entertained. So that's my popcorn mind. Good fun. And then there's another part of my mind that sometimes switches off when I'm watching a popcorn movie and I can just... If it's a really good popcorn movie, I can just fill my fucking soul with popcorn and enjoy the ride. And then there's another where, yeah, my popcorn brain is popping off at one side, no pun intended, and my, my analytical brain hasn't switched off because it isn't good enough to make me switch off and I'm just 
I'm enjoying things while also acknowledging they're bad. But like I said, let's not use the word bad for a minute. Let's use the word dated. I think the acting is really dated. The directing is really dated. The execution is really dated. I think every idea for as well as it's taught theoretically this doesn't work and we own a writer's um fucking android is the it's basically the representation of how I feel about the whole movie could have been a good idea why are you there doesn't really work and when I see something in 1997 that's really dated, like you said, you came across it in the best possible circumstances to to enjoy this movie, which is good. I wonder how I would feel if I had that experience. Maybe I might feel more similarly to you but the problem is I'm coming across very dated things that felt less dated two movies ago that felt more polished two movies ago that felt refreshing and really well executed so I'm not going into it with the same mind that I normally would if I'm watching a movie from the 90s, 80s or 70s when I see things and I'm just ignoring them because, okay, well, that's what you expect from a movie like that. Whereas because I've seen someone and I can compare it so directly to the same franchise and to the same monster and to the same archetypes, because I've seen it executed way better than I'm almost unforgiving of the dated the dated missteps well I guess you can't call it a misstep if it's dated but it's just something that I'm not able to forgive and roll with in the same level as as something or anything really that I would normally come across so so that's an interesting thing we've discovered from you jumping on board from Alien Tree and Alien Resurrection and me having the the groundwork put in with Alien and Aliens it, it because I know that I would probably be able to forgive some of these things if I didn't have a direct comparison from the same franchise completely fresh in my mind so there is that and just another straight thing i think life is way better than this this isn't on the level of life i i feel like life is one of my favorite sci-fi monster movies in the last 20 years i, I would say but anyway that's a side note i had to get that in there I'm not gonna have lice <laughs> and yeah, it is very interesting that you thought that design was terrifying and it really worked for you. That is a surprise. It, I guess it's a, it's a practical effect, which is good. The idea of the natural birth is really good. Like I said, I believe I said that two weeks ago if I can remember my memory and I think the scene where it gets sucked out of the the air shaft was brutal and maybe if I'm being somewhat kind even though there's truth to what I'm saying also that probably hit really hard because of the anthropomorphic nature of the design, which I really hated and really didn't like, I will give it its due 
that because of those eyes and because the human like quality and because of the complicated relationship between the new Ripley and the aliens themselves, I thought that really hit harder than it would have otherwise and it hit harder despite the design. And the alien franchise has always had a interesting relationship with what the aliens represent in terms of our feelings about birth. So, for instance, if you go by the first alien, a man gives birth, essentially, and it's about a man's fear of childbirth. And they did that very intentionally to, to freak men the fuck out. In Prometheus, the Naomi Rapace character gives her gives her self an abortion, actually, essentially, to get rid of the alien parasite. Uh, I was watching it with my partner, and obviously she's a woman, so she had... She's got a different interpretation as a woman. She says some of this. I don't remember if she said it in relation. No, she didn't say it in relation to Alien Resurrection. She said it in relation to one movie. She always feels the way that Alien get implanted forcefully is very akin to feeling of sexual assault. Like the, the idea of sexual assault in terms of that something's been forced upon you and put upon you. And then... You know, that whole fucking thing, which I thought was an interesting observation from a woman's point of view, like that that might remind you of just navigating the world as a woman. Um, whereas we don't really have to worry about that. So when the when the xenomorph is jumping on the fucking face, we're thinking, fuck, but they're thinking, yeah, I remember when a man was in my face, you know, so that that's interesting. And. This one through the through the the suction was almost like an abortion as well, where they suck out the fetus, which is a a type of abortion, and it's in a way there's a case to be made that Ripley in this movie she almost has conflicting states of mind over whether to keep the baby or not, and that end scene represents. You're literally aborting your own fucking kid after it was born. So there is always these psychological elements to the alien movies that work on another level. So I will concede that the creature design, in a way, made that scene more personal than if it was the standard alien design, even though I did think it was absolutely ridiculous <laughs> for the record. But funnily enough as well, just a side note, Joss Whedon was saying that he intended this movie to be a good time and really fun and basically like an episode of Buffy, essentially. And... He said the problem was everybody played this really straight. And when you think about it with that way, with that in mind, that <laughs> it's maybe everyone else missed the point. And maybe Joss Whedon's dialogue is there the whole time. It's just people are reading the lines wrong. But yeah, anyway, get on Alien Romulus as soon as you can, probably when it gets released for download. But yeah. The con conversation would have to continue. Yeah, I think you'll need to rewatch Romulus when I watch it so we can talk about it properly. Um, I just don't really like watching horror movies in the cinema because there's no chance of me being scared, whereas um, Fede Alvarez is probably my favorite contemporary horror director. And any of his films I kind of want to save for the small screen late at night, alone, pitch black, all that. Um, <clears throat> interesting that little tidbit about just we i mean certainly the score and the set design and the acting is very anti joss whedon or anti buffy so i uh, it is 
it's interesting. It's hard to almost like parse through that and imagine what this film would be like if it had a Joss Whedon energy. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, as you said, like we're we're we're, we're on different pages here. <clears throat> we, uh, I think, just it's 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 very hard to reconcile our experiences together when you've come out of Alien and Aliens. Uh, like for example, what you're saying about this being dated. I think the special effects in this are, are like just so far ahead of um what we see nowadays and i'm talking about like the monster effects like you're not gonna see anything in guardians of the galaxy 3 or something like that that um can come close to the practical aliens in alien resurrection um, and of course there are dated effects in it here and there but surprisingly less than i anticipated considering how old it is um and yeah mercifully few cgi alien shots in the film and when when they are there they're fairly smartly used they're kind of in the background and stuff i mean i haven't seen romulus but i'm assuming it's all cgi aliens and if it is then that film in 25 years is probably going to look pretty awful um, but I, I mean i haven't seen it but you know what i mean like that's practical effects just hold up for a lot longer i do like the idea of del toro directing now that you mention it directing an alien movie um i i get what you're saying about like maybe the grotesque body horror that del toro might have brought or almost like the cosmic horror is like you don't feel that it's delivered upon here like the idea is there but the actual execution isn't there like for me it's just completely executed upon i think right from the opening title sequence which is all shifting almost surrealist bits of body parts and alien parts and stuff um through to all the like autopsy scenes and dissections and obviously the, the different clones and the tubes and the um incubation scene where the we get the um the uh the people that they've kind of like stolen who were in deep sleep and then impregnate them like it, the whole way through this is peak body horror but it's not like um Cronenberg where it's body horror but in an arty way it's like somehow only just to mix like the peak of body horror with a uh just like a very easy to understand maybe that's not like thematically rich or anything like that and it kind of reminds me of Paul Verhoeven a bit like a Total Recall or something or The Fly where it's like you're it is a lot of body horror but you're also just getting like a adventure blockbuster type movie and usually you're going to get like a hint of body horror in that but like it's not really going to go there this film goes all over the place and i think the execution of that side of things the grotesquerie is really really strong in this um it's funny that like that throwaway bit of ron perlman shooting the spider like you mentioned it i've re responded to it you've responded to that i have to bring it up again it's such a throwaway tiny bit of the film and i guess to you it kind of it's, it represents a general kind of stupidity but I do want to just be a little pedantic because you've twice said that he shoots a load of bullets at this spider that doesn't actually happen he in an earlier scene he he's has a little quip about um Ripley wasting ammo which to me is more like his personality than um the kind of like a major uh concern of his and later on he's on a ladder in the most high stress situation imaginable shooting shitloads of bullets down at aliens then he turns his head and there's a spider like a inch from his head which scares the fuck out of him and he shoots one bullet at the spider like in a kind of like shock response type of thing almost like throwing a slipper at it or something the gun that he has in his hand that he's currently shooting loads so i think the way you're describing it does make it seem more laughable but i think if we're going with this bill paxton in aliens type of characterization i think it works and you know i get what you're saying about like having the strong center back uh, making everyone look better aliens obviously is a much 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 better movie than resurrection and it and like you know like you said with even things like newt it it, it manages to make everything work um i agree it's a better movie and the things work better in uh, uh in aliens than they do in this 
I just think that this is a good movie and things work well. I also like life a lot and I think life is a good movie and it makes things work well. Um, you think Resurrection is a bad movie and the things don't work in it. And that's the, uh, uh, like, when I see, um, you know, Brad Dourif's character in this, I'm not, I'm not like a character for the ages. I want a poster of this guy. I want this, like, this is just perfect, perfect. Give me more, give me more. I'm just saying it works for me. It all works well. Uh, it's not amazing, but, um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm entertained by it all. And there's nothing that's like, I'm not, I'm not there's no bit of this movie and I'm including Perlman shooting the spider here where I'm like, ah, Jesus Christ, come on, that's fucking ridiculous. It just all works for me. Um, in the second half, it, the, the problem with this movie is that the first half is boring and that you don't give a shit about anyone or anything in the movie because it's just all dour and there's nothing to invest in. But once once shit gets going, I think it has a lot, a, a hell of a lot going for it. Um, and yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about the like, sexual assault angle i mean that's certainly always been there for me like right from when i remember first seeing like the face hugger and stuff it was very much uh clearly a film about reproduction about sexual assault about sex basically like about maternity um this is a theme that they've just continuously explored over and over again even in a very like unvisceral way like cloning androids you know creating life all that kind of stuff and then ultimately in prometheus like creating humankind and all this shit um i like that i think it's nice to have a franchise that has some ideas underneath it like the matrix franchise is similar in that regard it's like you'd i don't want it to get super lore heavy and like bogged down in just a intellectual academic movie i still want it to be like a, a fun monster movie but at least there's something of interest there um but yeah anyway i mean we've kind of talked about it as much as we can in a way and like you said we can maybe maybe talk about it a little more once i've seen romulus which will be a little while but um i'm glad i saw it i'm glad i checked it out i think i probably need to check out Alien vs. Predator Requiem, just so that I can go... I've seen every Alien movie. Um, though I'm not expecting much from that. I think it's... Is it still Paul W.S. Anderson, or did he just do the first of those? Not sure. Anyway. Uh, it's, a, it's a movie. Um, and I think... It sounds like we both got more out of it than we were expecting. So, at least we have that in common. Yeah, I just looked at that scene again, and he did shoot the spider once, so it's funny. <laughs> but <laughs> what I remember is, uh, like, a riddle of bullets going off. Probably what I was remembering was the guy shooting all the bullets prior to that, because it has been a few weeks. Um, Yeah, not, not to labor on that point, but the reason why that sticks in my mind, that is the pinnacle observation of this movie, is that... I really enjoyed that scene. I found it funny, but I also found it completely ridiculous, which sums up the movie for me. I found it ridiculous, but I en enjoyed my time while watching it. So, yeah. It, under that, under that, guys, if someone said, oh, should you watch Alien Resurrection? How I'd recommend it was, it's got some really good ideas. If your brain is dead and you're tired of, and you're just wanting to put something on that would be fun, that's that's the movie for you. I'd have no problem saying that. And as far as you're saying with Alien vs. Predator, all I remember is there was this commercial on in Ireland with this stat oil goy. Goy? Goy? This stat oil guy. And then he shows up as one of the leads in Alien vs. Predator. And I've never seen the actor before. I've never seen the actor since. But that level of quality was indicative of how I felt about the movie. The stat oil guy is in this movie. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's the first one. 
of the Alien vs. Predator. I think I have seen them all. So good luck to you. Closing that. Closing that book. Off your list. But yeah. We'll reopen this when you've seen Alien Romulus. That I will have to rewatch again also. But. I'd be happy to. Yeah, and I'm just going to add now, I, I agree with everything that you just said there. I agree with the sentiment that you described the, the movie with. I enjoyed it a lot more than you, but I hadn't just seen Alien and Aliens. And I think that the good ideas in this movie are well delivered on, uh, mostly. I, I, I think some stuff in the movie is absolutely fantastic. But um, I just think it's, you know, the fact that you had just watched two of the best sci-fi movies of all time directly before it is just gonna have an impact certainly did on alien 3 where you thought that was absolutely horrifically bad and i thought like it had some decent stuff it's like you the the come down from aliens to alien 3 is just like absolutely enormous um one thing we haven't actually mentioned is with alien 3 we both watched the assembly cut and we talked a little bit about the difference between the assembly cut and the theatrical cut and obviously the theatrical cut completely wrestled away from Fincher and the assembly cut an attempt without Fincher's involvement to make the something closer to his vision. Alien, I've seen the director's cut. Aliens, I've seen the director's cut. And both of them I've seen the theatrical cut. I, I think I've seen both of the director's cuts in the cinema, even of those two movies. But this movie, when they made the Alien Quadrilogy DVD box set, they... They put a longer version of Alien Resurrection, I think it's only like seven minutes longer or something, in the in the DVD box set. And it has apparently like the only difference is that the first scene and the last scene are different. And Jean-Pierre Genet came out and said, that long version isn't the director's cut, the theatrical version is the director's cut, that the theatrical version is what he was wanting to do. And... Uh, the uh, longer version it's just kind of like an interesting oddity I I just watched whatever was on Disney Plus I think it was the theatrical cut I'm assuming it was anyway but uh, what I haven't done and what I might do now on YouTube or something is just check out what the other things were because the end of this film is again a good idea I think it's quite quite nice It's we, we've never seen Earth in these movies and we don't go to Earth, so we don't see aliens running through shopping malls and stuff. We don't even find out what Earth looks like on a civilization level at this stage in human history. But we do get to see the planet, like, soaring over the planet, looking out the window. And Ripley's not dead. I mean, it's not really Ripley, but, you know, she's a surviving character. And you could totally continue this story on. I mean, I'm assuming they offered Sigourney a lot of money to do a fifth alien. And she turned it down. I mean, I can't see any reason to not do that. But, uh, yeah. It is a pretty cool ending, in a way. So there's something there left <laughs> left, left on the table. Um, maybe we'll get some sort of, like, AI deepfake Sigourney Weaver fifth alien movie in, like, 30 years' time or something. Uh, but, yeah. I think we're, we're, we're on similar territory with this movie. And we both enjoyed it. Um... So that's saying something about a film that just really has no one in its corner. I mean, it's not, it doesn't even have people saying it's shit, never mind people saying it's good. It's just like a completely forgotten movie, but was one of the biggest films of its year in terms of like budget, profile, all the rest of it. It's just swallowed up into the, uh, the alien black hole, sucked out the, the little hole in the window. Hey man, been a few days since I sent that last voice note. Just thought I'd drop another one in because I have just watched the, as far as I'm aware, the only extended portions of the extended edition of Alien Resurrection, just in case you're interested. For it starts off with a very, very weak opening credit sequence which is like a big kind of a pull out of the spaceship where everything goes on um just comparing that to like the awesome title sequence in the theatrical 
alien resurrection where it's all like morphing body parts and kind of mixture between alien and human i think that was like a brilliant decision to change that and then more interestingly the film the theatrical version which i think is what both of us saw ends with like a sort of skeleton crew uh sigourney winona ron perlman and i think his name is dominic pignon on the little mini ship flying over earth and we don't really get to see earth it's kind of like we're looking down on clouds and it's this sort of ambiguous but somewhat hopeful ending of like hmm, starting a new adventure on earth now the extended edition they actually land and the surface of earth is like post-apocalyptic it looks like an absolute fucking hellhole like worse than mad max like just pretty much like the worst (laughs) situation there you don't actually see any people or any signs of life but yeah it's just like it's gone completely to shit and uh the very final shot in the film kind of pulls back to reveal where they are and they're in paris you can tell by like an eiffel tower that's half fallen over and, and stuff like that um which i thought was an interesting touch considering i uh, certainly uh jean-pierre Genet's next film amelie is very famously set in paris i think all in montmartre uh i think his films in general are set in paris if i remember correctly but um yeah it's just an interesting tiny little nugget of like that's probably the only thing in the movie that's like or it's probably the thing in the movie that's most tied to the rest of his career and it was cut out um but the theatrical ending was way better unlike that kind of little hopeful ambiguous note as opposed to like well okay so they they saved earth from the aliens landing but there's nothing left on earth so what was what is this situation they're in now anyway um don't feel obliged to apply reply to this one but just thought i'd drop one last voice note into this conversation uh having seen that last little bit and i think i'm done with aliens now for couple of months until we'll check out Romulus yeah what I can remember of this movie now is getting lost like tears in the rain to quote that guy from Blade Runner but I do remember the scenes where they're seeing the sky of her and everything like that in the the final moments of alien resurrection and and that decision i thought was pretty damn cool it is also worth mentioning that this is probably the time that the most members of the cast survive by the end of the movie and just to actually clarify what you're saying are you saying that the director's cut was the director's vision or are you saying that these scenes that seem a lot worse that were cut were was actually what the director intended and the studio interfered or or what what are we what are we saying here because the scenes that have been omitted seem to and again this is about actually seeing them seem to have made the film worse and i know that you are a champion for the the end monster design i think it's ridiculous but anyway still haven't gotten over that weeks later but let's just say you're right and the design really works right apparently that wasn't the original design There was an add-on where two massive genitals, so it was meant to be, I guess, intersex is the word. The creature was meant to be intersex, and it was meant to have two big massive genitals on display. You can find an image of it. I think it's on Screen Rant, if I'm not mistaken. And the studio stepped in and were like, no, fuck this. That's terrible. We're going to... 
we're going to get rid of that and like change the design enough. So if the studio was responsible for all these decisions to enhance the product, then they've done a very good job. Just a final bit of Alien Resurrection trivia that I found out the other day coincidentally. It came up on my Facebook timeline. So there was a game based on Alien Resurrection. And I'm not sure if it was the first, but it was certainly the most mainstream title to do this. And all the reviews were tanking it and complaining about this feature. And they were saying that the decision to use the left analog to control the movement of the character and the decision to use the right analog to control the camera was ridiculous and terrible decision and all over the place and like slated it for that decision and and what do we know that that is the standardized controlling method for video games they all do that now so again i don't know if alien resurrection was the first i don't know but the fact that all these reviewers called attention to it and criticized it it must have been the one of the first mainstream ones that brought it to people's attention that's quite funny i thought the legacy of the movie also transcends to the game perhaps that would have changed how controllers are set up for third person action adventure games so that's pretty cool that's fascinating i didn't even know there was an alien resurrection game but yeah if it if it did introduce that then you've got to be talking about one of the most influential games of all time i mean certainly uh mario 64 I think it was famous for having like introducing the move the camera around and the camera was a character like a little flying guy holding a camera and they really had to kind of tutorialize that but um yeah interesting little tidbit it's funny because if that is true and i i never fact check anything that sounds interesting like let's just let that um that little factoid just fester in my mind so that i accept it as reality forevermore but uh the Alien game franchise must be one of the most influential game franchises of all time. Because you've got that little thing about Alien Resurrection, which I must look up. It'd be interesting to see if the game actually is any good now. Um, then you've got Alien vs. Predator, which was phenomenal. I loved that. I, I really, really loved that game growing up. And when the movie was made years later, Alien vs. Predator... Um, I had high hopes for it because, the, you know, I'd liked the game so much that the movie was pretty awful. And then you've got one of the best horror games of all time and one of the most influential video games of all time, Alien Isolation, which I think has not only influenced um, video games, but also, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's been an influence on Alien Romulus. I believe that was uh, quoted as an influence by Fede Alvarez. Um, but yeah, interesting stuff there uh, on the director's cut question so basically Ridley Scott as he's wont to do made a director's cut I think James Cameron did as well uh, and then David Fincher he was just kind of famously known that what we got to see that was released in cinema was not the intention of the director so they cobbled together a direct uh, like a fake director's cut based on his notes and then because they had done the work for those three movies, I think, and they were releasing the Alien Quadrilogy, which is one of the biggest DVD releases of the 2000s, or certainly one of the most high profile. They were like, well, we got to have an extended edition of this as well. So they put in a, an ulterior opening scene and closing scene. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's it. And like I said, both make it worse. Jean-Pierre Genet then came out and said, by the way, this isn't a director's cut. The film that was released in the cinema is the director's cut. This is something else. Now, I don't know anything more than that, so I don't know if it's like 
studio interference made positive changes or made negative changes or what you know usually if there's two versions of something like quite different you'd think that that's the studio coming in and saying don't do the other one but you know i don't know all the details um i'll have to look up that other design of the alien uh i mean what i'll say for him i absolutely adore amelie i really really love that movie although i haven't seen it for a long time i i enjoyed a very long engagement quite a lot i enjoyed delicatessen a fair bit i think city of lost children i've only seen the beginning but i'm very very curious to check it out now mick max i thought was okay um and I haven't seen anything since Mick Max. So he's a bit all over the place in terms of like how much I like him. But he is a weirdo filmmaker. Like when you're describing that other version of the alien. That is, uh, yeah, sounds like he might do some weird thing. And that the studio might step in and reel it back. It would be ironic if after ruining Alien 3, 20th Century Fox then improved alien resurrection via the same method of heavy-handed interference but yeah i don't know who knows um the only thing that makes me think that the end scene that i just saw last night might be um jean-pierre Jeunet's doing is the fact that it's set in paris which seems like for an american movie american blockbuster hollywood blockbuster it's the only reason i can think to, to end it there is because because of the Eiffel Tower, it has probably the most iconic skyline in, in the world. So maybe if you want to show a completely ruined post-apocalyptic city, but make it instantly recognizable, it might it might be, I guess, along with New York with the Statue of Liberty, it's, those are probably the two cities that you can like most instantly recognize. But um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm glad that he was able to bounce back from this movie and this experience with Amelie, although I don't really know anything about um, how it went for him. What I'd actually like to see is the Aliens... Th- so they, they made a, like, behind-the-scenes loads of content for the, the DVDs, and they made a behind-the-scenes of Alien 3 with interviews and stuff like that. And Fincher pulled no punches and was, like, trashing Fox so hard that... Um, that they just didn't release that. They just like scrapped that whole featurette. How cool would it be to see a behind the scenes of the movie that's talking about what a disaster is? And I know we got that like Terry Gilliam making of the man from Don Quixote and stuff. There's been a few movies where it's come out. It's a standalone thing and it's like, or, or ones that are made years later, like about Apocalypse Now and stuff where it's like, Okay, the film's out, it's been a success, we're not in the marketing story of it, and nobody's kind of losing face, it's not just completely slagging off the studio. But to see a making of this just completely slagging off the studio would be interesting. Um, We watched a film a few years ago called uh, Bloody Nose and Empty Pockets, I think it was called. Um, Sort of documentary, documentary documentary-ish, debatable whether it's documentary about a kind of um, dive bar in America. And the brothers that made that film made a documentary about the making of Wendy, which was the film that the guy who made Beast of the Southern Wild made after that. He you know, made a big Peter Pan movie. And those brothers came along for the ride and filmed the whole thing. And apparently the that behind the like that making of movie thing they made was like very candid and very um didn't necessarily portray the executives in the best light and i think that also got kind of disappeared away uh but yeah although i think that is available but it's it's yeah maybe it was a difficult thing to put out and on that note just hearing thunderstorms outside So I think we can wrap up our weeks and weeks of discussing Alien Resurrection and move on to new movies. Your mailbox is full. Please delete new or stored messages which you no longer need so that new messages may be received.